Hi, I am Dr. Silveraj, your surgical educator from Malaysia. Welcome back to my series of surgical teaching video casts. These are meant mainly for undergraduate medical students doing the surgical clerkship rotation. I promise you will become competent in clinical problem solving and surgical decision making if you are going to watch these videos over and over again. Today in this episode, I am going to discuss one more epigastric lump that is abdominal aortic aneurysm. I am going to discuss this topic under the following subheadings. So after watching this video, all of you should be able to understand the various causes for epigastric lumps, the epidemiology, risk factors, etiopathogenesis, natural history, clinical features, investigations, treatment, and complications of abdominal aortic aneurysm. Of course, I will be discussing separately about how to diagnose and manage a case of ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. I have also included a mind map and a treatment algorithm. So what are the various causes for epigastric lumps? They are epigastric or omental hernia, pancreatic solid or cystic tumor including the pseudocyst of the pancreas, gastric carcinoma, GIST that is gastrointestinal stromal tumors especially GIST in the stomach and the AAA that is abdominal aortic aneurysm which is what we are going to discuss today. The retroperitoneal sarcoma and hepatomegaly especially the left lobe of the liver. Coming to the epidemiology of abdominal aortic aneurysm, what is the definition of an aneurysm? Aneurysm is a permanent focal dilatation of an artery to at least 1.5 times of its diameter. Then only it is called aneurysm. Suppose in a normal adult male, the normal size of the aorta is 2 cm. If they are having more than 3 cm size aorta, that means it is abnormal, the patient is having abdominal aortic aneurysm. If the arterial dilatation is less than 50% of its diameter size, then it is called vascular ectasia. If there is diffuse enlargement of several arterial segments that are 50% or greater than 50% of the normal diameter, it is called arteriomegaly. The abdominal aortic aneurysm is the main or the most common type of aneurysm. Male is to female ratio is 3 is to 1. The relative risk for first degree relatives of the affected individual is 13 point, sorry, 11 point six times greater than the general population. Those with known popliteal and femoral aneurysm have a 50% likelihood of also having AAA or abdominal aortic aneurysm. What are the risk factors? Risk factors may be acquired factors like cigarette smoking. This is the strongest modifi modifiable risk factor and chronic hypertension, those who are elderly patients, those who are more than 50 years old, and those patients who are going to get heart transplant, heart plan, transplant recipient. So these are all acquired risk factors. There are some inherited or genetic risk factors. Those who are having connective tissue disorders like Marfan and Eugler's Dunlop syndrome, they are having more risk to develop this abdominal aortic aneurysm. And those who are the first degree relatives with AAA uh, is having more risk to develop this abdominal aortic aneurysm. Here in this picture, you are seeing a classical picture of infrarenal abdominal aortic aneurysm. 
this is 95% of the patients are going to have only this infrarenal variety. The suprarenal and thoracoabdominal varieties are very rare, only 5%. Coming to the ETO pathogenesis of AAA, the causative factors could be the atherosclerosis, which can cause arterial wall degeneration with concurrent loss of el elastin caused by proteolysis, and this inflammation leads to a fusiform or the spindle shaped aneurysm. This is one cause, this is atherosclerosis. Or it could be an infection of the arterial wall by either by Salmonella or Staphylococci. And this, is, this will cause what is called mycotic aneurysm. So coming to the location, I told you already 95% of AAA is infrarenal abdominal aortic aneurysm. Juxtarenal means it extends up to the renal arteries. Suprarenal extends to superior mesenteric artery and celiac axis. And another thing is the thoracoabdominal. 10 to 20% of these uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm patients will be having involvement of iliac arteries as well. 40% of these patients are hypertensive patients, whereas 30% of them will be having coronary artery disease. 4% of these patients, abdominal aortic aneurysm patients, they will have either femoral or popliteal artery aneurysms. Coming to the natural history of abdominal aortic aneurysm, the diameter is the strongest predictor of the rupture of the AAA. Increased size means increased rate of rupture. This is depicted by the Laplace law, which says a larger radius increases the wall tension, which in turn increases the risk for rupture of the aneurysmal wall. Average growth is 0.4 cm per year. Growth is often staggered growth. That means aneurysm may be stable for one period and then grow rapidly in another period. The risk of rupture is based on the size of the artery. Women have a higher rate of rupture at smaller diameters. Renal artery involvement, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and diastolic hypertension are all uh, factors that will increase the rate of rupture. The risk of rupture is based on the size. We told already the AAA diameter and the risk of rupture per year. If it is four than, I, I, sorry, if it is less than four centimeter, almost the uh, the risk is almost zero. If the size is four to five centimeter, the risk of rupture is 0.5 to five percent. If the size is five to six centimeter, then the risk of rupture is 3 to 15 percent. If the size is 6 to 7 centimeter, then the risk of rupture is 10 to 20 percent. If the size is 7 to 8 centimeter, the risk of rupture increases to 20 to 40 percent. If the size is more than 80 centimeter, almost 30 to 50 percent of these triple uh, A patients are going to have a rupture. Coming to the clinical features, what are the symptoms? Most of the AAAs are asymptomatic. Two-thirds of the known AAAs are incidental findings on imaging studies done for some other reason. So it is incidental finding. Most common symptom is usually new onset abdominal pain and low back pain. Patient may also present as flank, inguinal, or genital pain. Symptoms may be caused by compression of the surrounding structures like inferior vena cava, ureter, or duodenum. If ruptured AAA, the patient will present with shock. 
are hemodynamically unstable. The triad for the ruptured triple A are severe abdominal pain, hypotension and pulsatile abdominal mass. These are the three things to make a diagnosis of trip, uh, ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. <coughs> what are the signs? The presence of pulsatile mass on deep palpation larger than 5 cm aneurysm. Larger than 5 cm, usually in these cases, aneurysm is palpable in up to 75% of these patients. In larger patients, it may be impossible to detect triple A regardless of its diameter, especially large patients meet obese patients. Regarding the other pulses, it is important to evaluate all the peripheral arteries for associated occlusive disease. You have to look for the peripheral pulses, you have to palpate it and you have to auscultate for any brewing. Or, addition, or any additional aneurysmal disease also you can find out. If ruptured AAA, there will be features of shock. Coming to the diagnostic investigations for abdominal aortic aneurysm, you can do plain X-ray abdomen, but only if the uh, aorta is calcified then only it is diagnostic. Otherwise, usually this is not a diagnostic test. If you are seeing, you can able to see this calcific rim and this is called XL appearance. Or you can see a large soft tissue shadow. Here in this picture, you are seeing it here. The dilated iota, you are seeing it. It is often visible projecting anterior to the spine. Here you are seeing it. But the screening imaging test of choice is, of course, the ultrasound. Because of the ease of its use and it is most cost effective also. You can also evaluate the blood flow in renal and visceral artery apart from making a diagnosis of AAA. Because of presence of gas in the abdomen, we couldn't pick up the suprarenal abdominal aortic aneurysm. Only infrarenal we will be able to pick up by doing ultrasound. Here you are seeing a plain ultrasound and this is with Doppler. So here you are seeing, this is the, you are seeing some part is already thrombosis, the lower part. This is the dilated iota. Here you are seeing the thrombosis inside, but here it is ruptured. You are seeing the blood is leaking through this rupture. Here in the Doppler picture, you can see it very clearly. So it is, the blood is leaking through the aortic wall and it is going to the surrounding areas. So this is a ruptured AAA. The gold standard investigation for AAA is of course CECT scan. It can provide acute characterization of the entire aorta. Uh, you can assess the diameter, the length, the wall thickness, and even the thrombus inside the iota also you can assess. You can also do the 3D reconstruction, which will be very useful for the endograft evaluation and planning for the endovascular surgery. Okay, so this is the gold standard. You are seeing the uh, CECT scan here. First picture, you are seeing an intact AAA. See inside you are seeing, this is the contrast you are seeing, this is the blood and this is the thickened arterial wall. This is an intact abdominal aortic aneurysm, whereas here in this picture, here also you are seeing, this is the uh, dye you are seeing inside, but this is a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. See, this is ruptured already and blood is extravasated outside. This is the gold standard, CECT scan. You can do MRI scan also, but this have a role in patients in whom intravenous contrast is contraindicated, then only you have to do this, I mean this MRI scan. There is no role of MRI scan in case of ruptured AAA patients, given the length of time needed 
to complete the examination because MRI will take more than 45 minutes. So for each patient, 30 to 45 minutes. So we cannot, if it is a ruptured uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, that is an acute emergency, you cannot go for MRI scan in that case. So another important investigation is aortography or the angiogram. Poor study for diagnosis or assessment of the size because the mural thrombus within AAA can obscure the actual aneurysmal sac size. It is very expensive and it is invasive also. It is replaced by either CT or MR, MRI angiogram. That is what we are doing nowadays. <coughs> that is what you are seeing in the second picture. Because that is a non-invasive and you can also make three-dimensional images. It provides information regarding associated vascular lesion for renal arteries and you can also see the distal runoff of the dye. Indication for iotography, if there is evidence of accessory renal arteries, horseshoe kidneys, mesenteric ischemia, and if you want to rule out peripheral arterial occlusive disease, then you have to do this iotography. But nowadays, we are doing either the CT angiogram or MR angiogram. Here in this picture, you are seeing the digital subtraction angiogram. But this is being replaced by nowadays CT angiogram or you can even do MR angiogram. You can see everything clearly in these pictures. Coming to the treatment of uh, intact abdominal aortic aneurysm, we can do open repair where you can use a synthetic material like the da Dacron graft to repair the aneurysm. You have to do a long midline incision, that is the laparotomy. The iota can be clamped below the renal arteries where possible to prevent renal ischemia. This is what you are seeing here. See, these are the renal arteries. You have to clamp the iota below the renal arteries in order to avoid ischemia to the both the kidneys. Then you have to make an incision here in the... Uh, Iliac arteries also, you have to occlude them, non-occlusive clamps you have to use, and then you have to make an incision in the iota, open it, and put this graft, this Dacron graft inside. You have to suture it above and below, then you have to wrap this wall of the aneurysmal wall over this graft. That is what you have to do. Graft can be straight if iliac arteries are not involved. Here you are seeing straight graft. Or it could be bifurcated also if both iliac arteries are involved. Then you have to excise along with the iota. You have to excise part of the uh, iliac arteries also, right and left iliac arteries. And you have to use a bifurcated uh, stent you have to use. Bypass stent. So another method of treatment is endovascular aneurysmal repair. And it is called EVAR. This is nothing but incision of a stent over the aneurysmal segment. So we are not going to do a laparotomy. This is a minimally invasive surgery. You have to do a small groin incision. Maybe this is a vertical or transverse. And you have to do under the uh, radiological, I mean, control. It doesn't require any cross clamping of the iota. Procedure is carried out under direct radiological guidance. It uses high doses of nephrotoxic contrast material. Reduce early mortality, high early uh, re-intervention rate if the patient is going to go for endoleak. I will tell what is endoleak. It requires lifelong surveillance in the during the post-op period for endoleak, I mean complication, you have to keep an eye to look for whether your patients are going for endoleak. Yeah, if you are doing this procedure, that is endovascular aneurysmal repair. So here you are seeing we are not going to open the abdomen at all. Maybe through the groin, you can go through these vessels 
and okay through the arteries yeah this common iliac artery and then maybe right or left iliac arteries you had to go inside but you had to put a <coughs> catheter and over this catheter you had to put this stent stent is here you are seeing the stent graft release from the catheter and then you had to withdraw the catheter slowly you had to pull it out this is the catheter you had to pull it out so that this will get expand this stent will get expand and this area so this is a normal area this is not the aneurysmal area here also it is normal area so here you are, you are seeing a bifurcated stent you are seeing we are not removing actually the aneurysmal shock still you are having the aneurysmal sac around this this stenting endovascular stenting so endo leak means after you are doing this procedure there may be blood flow should go only through this stent if there is some leak in this area and if the blood is flowing into the aneurysmal sac through this this area gap here or usually it is yeah forward here only so it will if it is entering into the the aneurysmal sac that is what is called endoleak coming to the complications you can broadly divide this into early complication and late complication early complication could be death it could be hemorrhage uncontrolled vessels or anastomotic breakdown or leak it myocardial ischemia can happen in 20% of the patients some of them may go for cardiac arrhythmias and even cardiac failure bowel ischemia is characterized by abdominal pain bloody diarrhea urgent laparotomy is indicated if patient develop peritonitis patient some of them may even go for abdominal compartment syndrome some may go for immediate post op go for atelectasis ards and respiratory tract infection some of them especially if you are doing endovascular procedure can go for endo leak so it needs lifelong surveillance or follow up renal dysfunction also can happen if your patient is having pre existing renal disease or you are using nephrotoxic contrast or antibiotic or patient is going for prolonged hypertension or dehydration or patient is using nsaids all these patients are having risk to develop renal dysfunction some of the patients can also go for limb ischemia so all these are early complication coming to the late complication okay graft may get infected usually if it get infected you have to remove the graft because it is very difficult to eradicate the infection from the graft so graft limb occlusion can occur within 30 days may present with acute ischemic limb some of them may go for aortoendric fistula and okay i already told about endo leak which can happen immediately or in some patients this can happen late also that is why you have to do lifelong surveillance some of them will go for impaired sexual function endo leak means i already told you persistent blood flow into an aneurysmal sac after the endovascular aneurysmal repair is performed there are five types of this endo leak type 1 means leak is leak is at the attachment sites of the graft type 2 is filling of aneurysmal sac by collateral vessels like the inferior mesenteric artery and the lumbar arteries okay it is not the leak from the uh, uh, from the anastomosis uh, 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 for not the leak at the attachment site it is actually uh, uh, blood backflow from the collateral vessels type 3 is leak through the defect in the graft type 4 is leak through the fabric of the graft due to the porosity in the gra graft may allow some of the blood will go through the graft into the sac aneurysmal sac type 5 is expansion of the aneurysmal sac without evidence of any leak on imaging <coughs> that is what is called type 5
Coming to the ruptured triple A, the clinical features are this can presentation may be delayed if rupture is contained within retroperitoneal space. A contained leak may initially be hemodynamically stable but can proceed rapidly to rupture and eventually the patient will be hemodynamically, he will become unstable. The long-standing leak causing iotoentric fistula can present with high output cardiac failure and GI bleed, sudden onset of abdominal, back or flank pain, sudden collapse with hypertension. Patient may have history of triple A and he is already under surveillance. Pulsatile abdominal mass is not always palpable, but the classical dryad is the severe abdominal pain, hypotension and the pulsatile abdominal mass in case of ruptured triple A. How to manage a ruptured triple A? This is an acute surgical emergency. So you have to first see whether your patient is alive or not because many of the patients know this ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. They may not reach the hospital alive. Many of them, 80% of them will die either at home or on the way to the hospital, they die. So make sure that your patient is alive, check for the airway and check for the breathing. You have to give 15 liters of 100% oxygen via the non-rebreather mask. Look for the circulation, start wide bore to wide bore peripheral IV access and give IV fluids. You have to rush in fluids. Do not aggressively hydrate the patient. Allow permissive hypotension to avoid worsening a rupture. So you shouldn't, I mean, <coughs> hydrate the patient, overhydrate the patient. You shouldn't overhydrate the patient because otherwise you will be worsening the rupture. Of course, you have to give analgesia also. You have to alert the vascular surgeon, anesthetist, theater and the ICU. Gain concern for the surgery. If not a candidate for surgery, you have to give only analgesia and palliative care only. Patient may not survive. If a candidate for open or endovascular repair, urgent transfer to the theater and you have to do either open surgery or endovascular repair. And after surgery, you have to shift the patient to ICU for the post-op care. Coming to the mind map, see whatever I have told so far, it is, I am highlighting only the main points in the AAA. What is the definition of aneurysm? It is the permanent focal dilatation of an artery at least 1.5 times of its diameter. Risk factors may be acquired factors like smoking, hypertension or elderly patient or the congenital or genetic factors like Marfan or Euglis Dunlos syndrome. Etiopathogenesis, it could be because of atherosclerotic degeneration of the vessel wall or which will cause the loss of el elastin by proteolysis or it could be infection of the arterial wall causing the mycotic aneurysm and 90% of these aneurysms are infrarenal in iota. That is why it is called abdominal aortic aneurysm infrarenal type. Clinical features, majority of them are asymptomatic. Abdominal and low back pain is the first symptom. If it is a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, then the patient will have this triad of a pulsatile abdominal uh, mass, hypotension and abdominal pain. You have to do the investigation. Abdominal x-ray is di diagnostic only if the iota is calcified where you can see an excel appearance. The screening uh, investigation is of course the ultrasound of the abdomen where you can pick up the case but the gold standard for the abdominal aortic aneurysm is CECT 
where you can evaluate the size of the uh, aneurysm, the vessel wall thickness, and the status of the thrombus, everything you can assess by doing this CCT. MRI is indicated only if the patient is allergic to the contrast and if you couldn't do the CCT, then only you have to do the MRI. And iotography also nowadays is replaced by either CT angiogram or MR angiogram. So treatment, you can do either open repair or endovascular aneurysmal repair. This is a treatment algorithm. Coming to the treatment algorithm, uh, it is, I am going to discuss the unruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm and the ruptured uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. So this is the, uh, the here you are seeing the um, algorithm. So the A is symptom, B is sign, C is investigation, and D is treatment. So A is you have to look for the presence of risk factor for development of aortic aneurysm. That is, in the history, you have to uh, ask all those things. Physical examination usually reveals a pulsatile aortic mass. And the investigation, the basic investigation is the duplex ultrasound, which, which by which you can make the <coughs> diagnosis of triple A, whereas the, this is uh, infrarenal triple A, which is more than 5.5 centimeter size. The, it weighs the risk and benefits of surgery. For patients deemed to be appropriate for surgery, you should do a CT angiogram to delineate the anatomy. That is what you have to do. Either CT scan or you can do, uh, do the uh, CT angi angiogram. So acceptable landing zones and assess, assess vessels are there. And if it is feasible for endovascular aneurysmal repair, then you go ahead and do endovascular aneurysmal repair. <coughs> and postoperatively, you have to lifelong look for endolics, evidence of any endolic. Suppose if there are no acceptable landing zones and patient is not a f uh, feasible to do endovascular aneurysmal repair, then you have to do a open abdominal aortic aneurysm repair where the post-op evaluation you should look for ischemia of the colon, ischemia of lower extremity, spinal cord, cardiac ischemia and you have to look for renal failure also. Suppose if it is a, sorry, suppose if it is a ruptured aortic aneurysm, okay, here also it is the same thing. This is symptom, this is sign, this, these are the investigation and E is the treatment. So you have to look for, if you are suspecting the ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, you have to look for the triad of abdominal pain, pulsatile abdominal mass or abdominal distension and hypotension. <coughs> so you have to have the high suspicion for ruptured AAA. You have to determine the feasibility of getting a CT angiogram. If, we, if you are able to do it immediately, okay, otherwise there is no need to do this. If patient is unstable hemodynamics, directly you have to stiff the patient to the OR. On table angiography should be done to determine if the candidate is for endovascular repair or otherwise. Landing zone length should be at least 15 millimeter. The neck angulation should be less than 60 degrees, then only you can do endovascular repair. So if patient is suitable for endovascular repair, okay, you can do endovascular repair, but where you have to do the hemorrhagic, hemorrhage control by using supraceliac uh, aortic occlusion balloon you have to use because we haven't, because we are doing it endovascular, you have to use balloon only to occlude the blood supply because we haven't done a, a laparotomy. So postoperatively, it is mainly you have to look for endoleak if you are doing endovascular surgery. Suppose if the patient is having a stable hemodynamics, you have to obtain a CT angiogram and determine if the candidate is for uh, endovascular surgery or not. 
If patient is suitable for endovascular, okay, you have to follow this. If patient is unsuitable for endovascular surgery, then you have to do open surgical repair. The key step is here, you have to hemorrhage control is by supraciliar aortic clamp. Unlike the endovascular procedure where we are using only the aortic balloon to control the uh, uh, bleeding, here you can use a clamp, occlusion clamp you can use. You should also ligate the inferior mesenteric artery if there is no back bleeding or pulsatile back bleeding is there, you have to do ligate it. And you have to post-operatively, you, you have to look for ischemia of limb and everything. Yeah, this is what you have to do. So, thank you very much for watching this video. If you think that these videos are very helpful, kindly subscribe to this channel and share these videos in your social media. Kindly click the bell button also to get notified regarding my latest uploads. Thank you once again for watching this video. Let us meet in an yet another episode. Until then, bye-bye.